And everybody said, Amen. Father, we thank you for our leaders meeting tonight. Thank you for our people. Thank you for your sons and your daughters. Thank you, Lord, for our pastors, and thank you for everyone. We're asking, O oh Lord, that tonight you open eyes of understanding. Help us to see everything you have for us in the world in Jesus' name. Empower your people. Energize your people. And we're praying that this week, what we have never seen, what we have never known, supernatural, power, great wonders in every heart, every soul, in Jesus' name. Confirm your word in every heart tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. That's all the amen you have. God bless you. You are blessed already. You can sit down. We are coming to Hebrews chapter 2. And I am reading from verse 9 and reading from verse 10. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Crowned with glory and honor. That ye by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him, befitted him, suitable for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing in many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. I want to emphasize those three words in verse 9. But we see Jesus. We see Jesus. The apostle had been writing about man. And as he wrote about man, he started from an earlier verse. And he spoke about what the psalmist had written. That God made man a little lower than the angels. And then to crown him with glory and with honor. And it said to him over all his words, and that he has put all things in subjection, verse 8, under his feet. And then he says, but as you look at man, he's looking at man on the one side, man like you, like me. Man like Adam. Man like the descendants of Adam. And he says, for all those men who have not seen anything, put under their feet in totality. Then he crosses over to the last Adam, to Jesus Christ, to the man, the son of man, the one that came from heaven, the one that was made a little lower than the angels because of the suffering of death, because of incarnation, because he became a child, a man, a son, and he died on the cross of Calvary. And in that way, being born as a baby, a little lower than the angels, in that way, walking the streets of Capernaum and Nazareth and Jerusalem, and everybody looking at him and looking at his stature, his posture as a man, a little lower than the angels, they could persecute him, and they could speak against him. He could be hungry. And he could even cry over Jerusalem. Angels don't cry. He was made a little lower than the angels. And then eventually he was even betrayed. Somebody came and they told a lie against him. And he betrayed him a little lower than the angels. Then they took him to the cross and he crucified him. You couldn't have crucified him if it were not that he became a man made a little lower than the angels. And then eventually he was buried a little lower than the angels, but he rose again. I said, Christ rose again. And he rose in power. He rose in authority. And now it says, we see Jesus. We see Jesus. It's looking at him from the gospel. We see Jesus. is looking at him as he bore our guilt, our griefs on the cross. We see Jesus. He says, but now we see Jesus is looking at him in glory. Because now things have changed. 
and he's gone up to heaven and he says, We see Jesus, who was pastors, made a little lower than the angels. And then it says, He was made a little lower than the angels, became a man for the suffering of death, vicarious death. He died for you and he died for me. And he says, But it's not on the cross anymore. Is your Lord on the cross anymore? No. It says, we we'll see him crouch with glory and honor. And that he, by the grace of God, after he tasted death for every man, now we we'll see him up above. That's what I'm looking at tonight. We we'll see Jesus. Who wants to see Jesus there? You'll see him. I said, you'll see him. But we'll see Jesus in the days of his flesh. When Jesus dwelt among men. When he was made a little lower than the angels. Men, sinful men. Men, sick men. Men, Satan afflicted men. Men, suffering men, oppressed men. Saw him and they were saved. They saw him while he was here on earth. And they were delivered. They saw him while he was here on earth. And they were healed. We will see Jesus. That's during the time of the gospel. That they saw him. And great, great marvelous things took place in their lives. Now on the cross. There was a man there on the cross. A condemned man. A criminal. A terrible sinner. He was dying and was spending his last days on earth. Do you know that condemned man saw Jesus and he was forgiven? He was liberated and was taken to paradise. He saw Jesus and said, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And he saw him right there at that critical hour. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, after the cross, after the resurrection, look at Stephen. As Stephen was being persecuted, and as he looked up, he said, I see the heavens opened, and I see Jesus, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand side of God. He was taken to heaven, he was translated to heaven. He saw Jesus, you will see him. And then, here was Saul. That's Stephen, I told you now. And I was thinking about Saul. He was going to Damascus. All of a sudden, he had his name. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He looked up, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus. And he saw Jesus. He was totally transformed. Before the cross, at the cross, after the cross, everyone that saw Jesus had transfiguration, had a change, had total transformation. And here we are after the cross. I want to see him tonight. I said I want to see him tonight. Look at this. We're looking at Luke chapter 5. Just to see Jesus Everything will turn around in your life. We're looking at Luke chapter 5 and believe from verse 12. It says, And it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, who seen Jesus, that is it, underline that in your Bible, who seen Jesus fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And he put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And what's the word there? Immediately the leprosy departed from him. That's what happened when you saw Jesus. Something must happen in your life when you see Jesus. We're looking at Luke chapter 19. And I'm reading from verse 3. Luke chapter 19, verse 3. And he sought. To see Jesus. Here is Zacchaeus. This was in the days of his flesh. One was still here in the world. And he saw to see Jesus. Who he was. 
and could not for the press because it was little of stature. You know the story? He climbed up the sycamore tree and eventually Jesus saw him and he saw Jesus. Look at verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I take anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. He saw Jesus, he was saved. I'm telling you that when you see Jesus, something must happen in your heart there. In John chapter 1, Verse 29, the next day, John sees Jesus. It's a special day in your life. A special day in John's life when he saw Jesus. And he says, the next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away, tell me, the sin of the world. And here now we come to this special scene of Jesus. Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9 verse 27. In Acts chapter 9 verse 27, well, Barnabas took him and brought him unto the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way. You see that? All you need to do is to see Jesus. That's why Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 tells us what we see, Jesus. And there is Saul, the persecutor that became a preacher. The person who had been fighting against the cross, against Calvary, against Christ, and he saw Jesus, things became different. Don't you know, your life is going to become different. Your family is going to become different. And the ministry of God in your hand is going to become different in Jesus' name. See him, see him, see him. Everything will turn around. That he had spoken to him and how he, was, he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Paul was referring to that in Acts chapter 22. Acts Chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 12. And what an ass, a devout man, according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Here is Saul now, here is Paul, relating what happened at that time. Brother Saul, receive thy sight. Somebody there, your sight will become brighter. I said your sight will become brighter. Receive your sight in Jesus' name. The same hour I looked up upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers has chosen thee. Thank God I'm chosen. Has chosen thee. I said, I am chosen. I'm chosen to do good. I'm chosen to do well. I'm chosen to preach the gospel. I will preach. I can't hear my people. And this work will prosper in your hand. Look at this, look at this. That thou shouldest know his will. And tell me. Tell me. And see that just one. And shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. You see there. And I has told him, the Lord has called you. And it is so that, although you saw him on the way to Damascus, but now you will see him, the just one, and you will hear his voice. And uh, Saul, Paul never forgot that. First Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? He said, What do you think gives me joy and gives me power? 
and gives me divine energy. What do you think gives, makes me running? Have I not seen Jesus Christ, our Lord? That's why on your lips tonight, in your heart tonight, as you express your desire tonight, we're coming to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse 21. John chapter 12, verse 21. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Everybody tell me out aloud. Sir, tell me. Say it aloud. Sir, we would see Jesus. Now you understand why it was so very important that they would want to see Jesus. We're talking tonight on beholding Jesus in his mediatory fullness. Beholding Jesus, wanting to see Jesus in his mediatory fullness. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, persuading sinners to see Jesus bearing our griefs. Persuading sinners, that's the ministry we have that will call on people will impress it on people, will persuade people, will plead with people, will proclaim to people, will preach the word of God to people, so that we get them to the point, the desire to see Jesus the Savior, to see Jesus the final sacrifice, and to see Jesus the power that will change everything in their lives, Turn everything around in their lives. Number one, persuading sinners to see Jesus bearing our griefs. Number two, prevailing on saints to see Jesus for godliness. Prevailing on saints to see Jesus for godliness. You see, when we come into the gospel, we come into the fold, into the assembly. We still need to be persuaded and we need to be, uh, let me use this word, prodded. It's like we want to drive everyone to have the desire. You want to see more of Jesus because after seeing him at Calvary, you must see him also at the point of resurrection. You must even go to see him at Pentecost so that as you are led on, and as we plead with you, and we persuade you that now you are a child of God, a saint of God, you still want to see Jesus for more of his grace, for more of his gospel, and for more of his godliness. Prevailing on saints to see Jesus for godliness. Number three, preparing his servants to see Jesus in his glory. Preparing a servants. Are you one of those servants? Do I have servants of God in the house? The Lord himself will make you see Jesus in his glory. Tell me number one. Persuading sinners to see Jesus bearing our griefs. We're coming back to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. For the suffering of death. He became a man, the son of man. And he died for us. And he suffered. He was at the weeping post. And stripes were laid on him. And by those stripes were healed. Not only that, they took him to the cross and he was crucified. Here we are told he suffered the suffering of death. And then it goes on to say, we'll meet, uh, you know, what's in the middle there, we'll come back to that later, that he, by the grace of God, should taste, tell me, tell me, should taste death for every man. There's no doubt in your heart. Somebody sometimes will say, Am I really going to be saved? He tasted death for you. 
Can my mother, my father, my relatives, can they be saved? He tasted death for every man. That man is so bad. That woman is so bad. And he's gone so far into the world. Can she be saved? Of course. He tasted death for every man. I've seen this man is sinned over and over and over. Is there any hope for him? Christ tasted death for every man. Make him to see Jesus. All his sins will be forgiven. Make him to see Jesus and peace of God will come to him in Jesus' name. Tasted death for every man. And then, this point we're looking at now, want to persuade the sinners so that they will see Jesus bearing our griefs. We're coming to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. And we're reading here from verse 3. In Isaiah chapter 15, verse, verse 3, is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. Let the sinners know that. Let the sinners know that. All the grief, all the guilt, all the godlessness of the sinner, Christ has borne them. He took everything. And it says, acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and, and we esteemed him not. Surely, he has borne, tell me, our griefs. He tasted death for every man. Let the sinner see that. Don't let them just see their sin. You know, there are times we preach to people, make them see their sin. They are terrible, they are wicked, they are useless, and they are nobody, and they are like warm, and they are the greatest sinners in the world. Maybe that is true. Maybe that is true. Make them see Jesus. That Jesus Christ has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for, tell me, our transgressions. Let them know that. Persuade them that Jesus Christ was wounded for a transgression. He was bruised for iniquities. He had suffered already. He has taken a punishment. And then it says, And the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone. There's mercy for everyone. There's salvation for everyone. And there's redemption for everyone. He tasted death for every man. And all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord, look at this, has laid on him. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Take that guilt away from you, transfer it to Jesus. Take that oppression away from yourself and transfer it to Jesus. And take the punishment and your fear of death and your fear of eternal judgment. Take it away and lay it on Jesus because the Almighty God Himself has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. But somebody must tell them, Somebody must persuade them that Jesus died for them. And once they see Jesus as their substitute, once they see Jesus as their Savior, many people are going to get saved through you in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. And we're reading here from verse 29. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8, reading from verse 29. It says, that Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. You must get to people. You must go to people. You must knock on their doors. You must enter their houses. You must enter their chariots. You must get near to them and touch them. But when you get near to them, there's just one thing you're supposed to do. Make them see Jesus. See Jesus, that Jesus bore their guilt, he bore their grief. And then Philip ran thither to him and heard him reach the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? The man was reading Isaiah chapter 53, where we read just now. 
that Jesus Christ has borne our grief. But the man could not see Jesus there, and yet Jesus was there, and he was reading the right passage. That's what we need to help people to do. They read the Bible, they don't understand. And they read those tracts, they don't understand. They read Christian literature, they don't understand. They read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they don't understand. They read the epistles, they don't understand. What to make them see? Make them see Jesus, that Jesus Christ tasted death for every man. And he bore all their shame, all their sorrow, and all their sin. And then he goes on to say, and he said, how can I understand except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him at the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before had his shearers, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray you, I plead with you, you must tell me something. Of whom speaketh the prophet this of himself? of some other man then philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture tell me and preach unto him jesus he made him see jesus that jesus christ has borne our griefs that's what we have to do that's what we have to go out and tell people and show people they don't have to die they don't have to perish and they don't have to suffer for their sins they don't have to suffer now they don't have to suffer in the future they don't have to suffer on earth they don't have to suffer in hell make them see jesus that jesus christ died for them and then as they went on, on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? That man had seen Jesus. His life had changed. His heart has changed. Transformation had come. If any man be in Christ, is a new creature. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Philip persuaded him to see Jesus bearing his grief. That's what we are to do. You know, there are many people, they go out and they're talking about church. They're talking about deeper life. They're talking about themselves. They're talking about stories in the Bible. They're talking about quotations in the Bible. They're talking about this, about this. And they can talk for one hour and the people they're talking to cannot see Jesus. But we see Jesus, that he tasted death for every man, and that is the responsibility, and that is the ministry the Lord has given us. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and that the eunuch saw him no more, but thank God he had seen Jesus. The people you are talking to will see Jesus. The people you are preaching to will see Jesus. And he went on his way rejoicing. Salvation had come. And the joy of salvation had been given unto him by the Lord. We're looking at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And we're reading here from verse 9. The people were to convince the people were to persuade that they must see Jesus. Romans chapter 3 verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? No, not no. In no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. All under sin. But remember, remember, for the Jew and for the Gentile, and for everyone under the oppression of sin, under the power and the yoke of sin, Christ has tasted death for every man. Go and persuade them. 
Go and reveal that to them. Make them see that Jesus Christ has borne our guilt. As it is written, verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre. But you need Jesus. And with their tongue, they have used deceit. They only need to see Jesus. And the poison of us is under their leaves. But you need to see Jesus' whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know. That what things soever the Lord saith, it says to them that are under the law, that every mouth, look at that, every mouth of every man may be stopped, and all the world become, tell me, guilty before God. Guilty before God. That's why everyone needs to see Jesus. That he has come to take to take our guilt away. He has come to take our uh, punishment away. Look at verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Be justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. They will be justified and is free. So that all their sins will be totally taken away, totally forgiven, and their lives will become new life in Christ. Now, to persuade them, because that's what we need to do, persuade them. We're coming to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13. Understand, when you go out, you're reaching out, what are you going to do? I'm going to do evangelism. You know what that means? Go, persuade them to see Jesus as their savior, see Jesus as their substitute, see Jesus as their sin bearer, see Jesus as the final sacrifice that takes our sins away. Acts chapter 13, I read from verse 38. Acts 13, verse 38, be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. His, here is Paul the Apostle. He said, through this man, Jesus Christ, he was telling him, just look at Jesus. He'll save you. Look at Jesus. He'll forgive you. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now he told them, verse 40, beware, 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 therefore, lest that come upon you, which is spoken in the prophets. Behold, ye despise us. Don't despise and wonder and perish for I walk a walk in your days a walk which you shall in no wise believe though a man declare it unto you and when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath now when the congregation was broken up Many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them, tell me the word there. Tell me the word there. Tell me what you are supposed to do. Persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Go from guilt to grace. Persuade them, persuade them. That's what Paul the Apostle did. That's how many people came to know the Lord. Acts chapter 18. I'm reading here from verse 4. Acts chapter 18 verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Persuaded, persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. You know if you are just preaching, I will say the people are not listening. Maybe you are not presenting the message properly. Maybe you are not telling them. You are not showing them how they will see Jesus. 
Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the final sacrifice. But you know, Paul the Apostle, when he took the Bible and he read something to them from the Bible, his goal, his aim, his intention was to persuade them. And he said, this man, if he comes from this direction of religion, I'm going to look at that religion. I'm going to persuade him that one will not work. Look at Jesus. If he comes from the angle of tradition, I'm going to show him tradition cannot save you. I'm going to present Jesus to him to the point he'll be persuaded. If he's looking at his own good works, I'm going to tell him his good works cannot do anything. I will make him see Jesus. And if you go out like that and you say, I know Jesus and I'm going to point the people to Jesus and they will see Jesus, many people are going to get saved through you. Ah, look at you. Amen. Verse 5, and when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and he testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. He testified that Jesus was Christ. Look at verse 8, in verse 8, and Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and they were baptized. He persuaded so many of them that he said, we can see now, we can see now. The law cannot save us. We can see now. Ceremony cannot save us. We can see now. Rituals cannot save us. We can see now. The old covenant cannot save us. We can see now. The temple cannot save us. They saw Jesus. Persuade them. Persuade them that they will see Jesus. They will be saved in Jesus' name. In verse, look at verse 9. Then speak the Lord to Paul in the night by vision be not afraid but speak and hold not thy peace for I am with thee the Lord will be with you his spirit will be with you his wisdom will be with you the passion will be with you and you will speak convincingly and you'll persuade them to come to the Lord in Jesus name for I am with thee and no man shall say to hurt thee for I have much People in this city, it will happen again. We're looking at Second Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter five, and we're reading from verse eleven. Second Corinthians chapter five, reading from verse eleven. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, because we know judgment is coming. And the only way to escape that judgment is to see Jesus, is to know Jesus, is to receive Jesus, is to believe in Jesus and see him as he died for you. And see him as he took your sins away. And see him as you are totally eradicated and taken away the punishment of sin. The secret of salvation and the secret of liberation and the secret of transformation and the secret of having peace with God and the secret of having your name in heaven and being free from the terror, the judgment, the damnation, the condemnation that will come is that to see Jesus. Therefore, Paul the apostle said, because we know the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also made manifest in your consciences. I pray that the wisdom to go out and persuade people to see Jesus as Savior, the Lord, will grant us the grace in Jesus' name. Now coming to point number two, prevailing on saints to see Jesus for godliness. Now coming back to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. And here we're reading from verses 9 and 10. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him. This was suitable for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one 
for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. He's telling us here that when you see Jesus at salvation, he doesn't stop there. He said, look at me. I saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. And as I saw Jesus on the road to Damascus, I said, Lord, I called him Lord. I received him as Lord. And he became my Savior, my Lord, my Master, the Messiah I'd been waiting for. And then after that salvation, I was in Damascus. I was praying three days and three nights. And then Ananias came and laid hands on me. My physical eyes, natural eyes were open. And then I began to see Christ in the scriptures everywhere. And then I saw him in glory. I saw him in godliness. He said, I got salvation and then I got sanctification and now he's writing, he says he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one because of that it's not ashamed to call them brethren and he even said salvation, wonderful sanctification, wonderful and then he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 I knew a man in the flesh I knew a man sometime ago, whether in the flesh or out of the flesh, I cannot tell. Who was taken and transported into paradise, into the third heaven. And I had things and I saw things I couldn't begin to reveal unto you. He was saying, I saw Jesus in glory. I saw him in grace, I was saved. I saw him in the gospels, I was sanctified. I saw him in godliness and I was made holy. I saw him in glory and he told me things I couldn't begin to tell you. You see, Jesus Christ wants to so purify you and sanctify you and purge you that more godliness will come in your life and it will make your service more acceptable unto him in Jesus' name. I said it will make your service to be acceptable in Jesus' name. Look at uh, Malachi chapter 3, and I'm reading here from verse 3. Malachi chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 3. And he shall see it as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them and purge them. These were servants of God. These were saints of God. These were people already serving the Lord. He will purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. That they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old, as in the former years. He will do it. I said he will do it. Look at uh, Psalm 19, Psalm 19. I'm reading here from verse 7. Psalm 19, we're reading from verse 7. It tells us in Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. And the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean enduring forever and the judgment of the lord is true and righteous altogether more to be desired are they than gold yea than much fine gold sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb moreover by them is thy servant warned and in the keeping of them there is great reward look at verse 12 who can understand his errors Cleanse me from my secret faults. That's godliness. Cleanse me. When you see Jesus as the one who purges and purifies, you see Jesus as the one who makes holy and he sanctifies. And the secret errors and the secret faults that you couldn't see ordinarily by yourself, he points them out to you. When you see him, you see him at the salvation. You'll be saved, but now you go ahead and you see him. And then you have been thinking, I'm all right, I'm all right. And then he makes you to see. He'll purify you in Jesus' name. We're looking at chapter 51 of the Psalms. Psalm 51. I'm reading from verse 6. It says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, 
and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom purge me with Esau and I shall be clean wash me and what will happen I said purge wash me and what will happen I shall be whiter than snow. You see, when you are born again, as white as snow. As white as snow. It says, do your sins be as scarlet? It says, he'll wash you. You'll be as white as wool, as white as snow. But now, the man of God is praying. He said, purge me, and I shall be whiter than snow. He will do it. He'll give us that godliness in our soul, in our heart, in our mind, in our thoughts, in our spirit. It will make us whiter than snow in Jesus' name. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. And with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, 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 is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, now understand, this man, Isaiah, had been preaching. Chapter 1, he was the one that said, Come, let us reason together. Chapter 2, he was the one that spoke about the people coming and drawing water out of the well of salvation. And then, chapter 3, he was the one that, you know, condemned all the worldly and sensual, licentious dressing of those uh, daughters of Zion. And in chapter 4, he was the one that was inviting the people and telling them, God will do something new, something great in your life. In chapter 5, he was the one saying that you drunk us and you call good evil, you call evil good. He was a great preacher, a great prophet, but now he saw the Lord. You will see the Lord. You know, before you see the Lord, after you are saved, after you are born again, you say, praise the Lord, I'm saved. And then you are rejoicing because of the joy of salvation. I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. You, you go here, I'm saved. And you go there, I'm saved. And you tell everybody I'm saved. But then you see Christ again. It is glory. It is goodness. And you see him in a higher realm. You see him in a greater way. And then you realize, I've seen him with the gospel of grace. I need to see him now with the godliness and that grace of God. Look at verse 5. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen. My eyes have seen. When you see him, you see him again, purity will come. You see him again, sanctification will come. You see him again, he will put your soul, put your mind, and put your heart. He says, I've seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim son to me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongue from up the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this has touched thy leaves, thine iniquity is taken away, thy sin is purged. That's the purging, that's the purification, that's the godliness there, and that is sanctification there. After that, when he became a purged vessel, a sanctified vessel, a godly man, then it says, and also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Then said I, somebody there? Then said I, but you know, it's not going to send a sinner to go and convert sinners. It's not going to send a blind man to go and lead the blind. It's going to send the people whose hearts have been purified so that they can go out there and prevail upon other people that they will see the Lord and they will see him for greater godliness. We are coming to Matthew chapter 5. 
In Matthew chapter 5, uh, I'm reading from verse 6. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. It says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You see, after you have received the mercy of God in salvation, and you have received the grace of God in salvation, and you have received the touch of the Lord in salvation, you still desire, you are passionate, you are desirous. I want to be sanctified. I want to be purified. I want a greater work of grace to be done in my heart, in my life. And the Lord will see that desire. He will see that passion. He will see that consecration. He will fill you with righteousness in Jesus' name. In verse 8, blessed at the pure in heart, tell me, for they shall see God. Blessed at the pure in heart, for they shall see God. God. He wants us to move ahead, to go ahead, consecrately everything on the altar so that this godliness, deep work of grace will be done in your heart. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and we're reading from verse 1. Having therefore these promises dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. There's something more than salvation. That's what he's telling us there. There's something more than a change of life, which we got at the initial time when we came to the Lord. There's something more than peace of mind. There's something more than, you know, praise the Lord, I'm righteous now. Jesus Christ came to my heart. That's wonderful. There's still something more. I've been there for uh, these promises, dearly beloved. Dearly beloved means we're born again. Dearly beloved means that we're children of God. Dearly beloved means we're saved already. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Second Timothy chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 21. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. It says, if a man therefore purge himself from these, uh, there's a part of each you do. That is, if there's anything that has the tendency of coming upon your life, and then uh, polluting you or defiling you, maybe something you read, maybe something you see, or maybe a, a person you have conversation with, it's, it just so happens that he doesn't know to talk right, and you'll be saying things that will introduce some corrupting things to your mind, put yourself, separate yourself from such an individual. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. Sanctified, you'll be sanctified. I said you'll be sanctified. I'm made for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. And when that happens, you will know that God is going to make use of you more than ever before in Jesus' name. Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, and I'm reading here from verse 7. Philippians chapter 3. Verse 7, it says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted laws for Christ. It said there were some things I used to uh, kind of appreciate and, you know, some of those toys and things and that might not even be sinful, but uh, they are not fit for a real man of God, a real woman of God. It said, Now I count them laws for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but laws for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Lord, for whom I suffered the loss of all things, and do count them, but dog, that I may win Christ, and be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which was of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness, which is of God by faith, that I may know him. He was born again already, that I may know him. He was a saint already, that I may know him. He was a servant of God already, that I may know him. He was an evangelist already, that I may know him. He had been to the third heaven and come back, and he said that I may know him. I pray you'll know him more. I said, you'll know him more. You see, there are people, they come to a meeting like this, and after finishing, after the message is finished, they just stand up while we're still praying, they have gone out. They do not have the desire, the passion, and they do not have uh, the enthusiasm inside them. I want to know him more. I want to know him more. And they remain ever the same. Something will happen today, a change will come. 
a transformation will come that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering be made conformable unto his death. And then he says, brethren, verse 13, brethren, verse 13, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth and reaching forth, somebody there tonight to reach forth. You'll get to levels you have never gone before. And you'll get the measure of the grace of God you have never gotten before. He says, I'm reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark of the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I pray that as you press on more of the grace of God, more of the goodness of God, and more of his godliness will be revealed unto you, imparted into your life in Jesus' name. You need to see Jesus more tonight. You'll see him more. I said you'll see him more. We're coming back to Hebrews chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2. We're looking at verse 9. It says, but we see Jesus. As sinners, we came and we saw Jesus. That's how we're saved. But we see Jesus. After we was saved, as saints of God... We looked at him again. That's how we're sanctified. And he sanctified us. That's not all. But we see Jesus is gone to glory. And being exalted the right hand of the Father. He has shed forth this which you now see and hear. He baptized us in the Holy Ghost. But that's not all. There's still more. There's more of heaven for every soul here tonight in Jesus' name. See him and you'll climb up. See him and you'll make progress. See him, you'll have more of him in Jesus' name. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. Crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for many people, for every man. Look at this. For it became a him. For whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing, tell me, in bringing, tell me more than that, in bringing many sons unto glory, many sons unto glory. That's the reason you need to see him. Many people just think, I saw him, I got saved. Yes, but that's not enough. It says, if we see him more, and you see him tonight, and you keep on seeing him, he will bring you to glory. He will bring his glory in your life, in your heart, in Jesus' name. And it says to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Look at First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, bringing many sons to glory. Point number 3 now, preparing his servants to see Jesus in his glory. Preparing his sons to see Jesus in his glory. Preparing yourself to see Jesus in his glory. First John chapter 3 verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we shall be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not, beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, when he appears in glory, we shall be like him. We shall be like him. Anybody there, we shall be like him. That's what he wants to do. He wants to bring us to glory. For we shall see him as he is. And every man, how many people? I said how many people? And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Purifies himself even as he is pure. He wants to bring us to glory. We're looking at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 1. Here is what it takes. Here is your part. Here is your responsibility as it brings you to glory. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above. 
not on things on the earth. For ye are dead. And your life is seen with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him. How? Shall ye also appear with him in glory. He wants to bring you to glory, not to disgrace. And you need to know that in your life. Anything that will not glorify God, bye-bye. Anything that will not honor the name of the Lord, bye-bye from your life in Jesus' name. Bringing many sons to glory, it will transform your life. Second Corinthians chapter 3, Second Corinthians chapter 3. I'm reading here from verse 18. Second Corinthians chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 18. But we all, how many of us there? I said we all, how many of us there? You see, nobody should be saying I'm not interested in this. You're not interested in Calvary, in the blood of Jesus, in the cleansing by the life, and in Christ sanctifying you, purifying you. I'm taking you from grace to godliness to glory. You must be interested. This is what Jesus Christ came to pay the price for. And he says, because he's done this, you want him to take hold of you and then pull you up. He'll take you higher in Jesus' name. And you get to the glory of the Lord in your heart, in your life, your ministry in Jesus' name. But we all, with open face, behold him as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. That's what we behold. That's what we behold. We behold the glory of the Lord. We are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We're looking at him, and as we look at him, he's transforming us, he's changing us, and he's transforming us from one level of glory to another level of glory. Look at uh, chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 1. Therefore, see, we have this ministry, and as we have received mercy, we faint not. You will not faint. Amen. You will not be tired. Amen. And you will not retire. Mm, I didn't hear the people now. Amen. I see some people there. They say, Pastor, permit me. Nobody will permit you if you go. Or you are tired. But the strength of the Lord bring you, bring you back in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, sometimes a little discouragement and sometimes a little challenge and sometimes a little crossroad and sometimes a little problem in the family, a little problem in your place of work and then uh, I don't think I want to go today. No, you want to come every time. I said you want to come every time. The strength of the Lord will pull you up in Jesus' name. We have received a ministry. I have received a ministry. I said I've received a ministry. Ah, but look at my child. All the same, I've received the ministry. As you keep coming and you're looking at Jesus, the healing virtue of Jesus will pass to that child in Jesus' name. And look at my husband, look at my wife. I'm telling you, if you will not pull back because of my husband, if you will not pull back because of my wife, all those good things you deserve for your husband, for your wife, as we're looking at Jesus, glory will come to your family. Glory will come to that husband. Will come to that wife. Revival will come in your family in Jesus' name. You have received a ministry. Have you got a ministry? Where are the people there? You've got a ministry. You will not be tired. You will not faint in Jesus' name. As your father and the Lord is running, you'll be running after him. And uh, some of you, young people, you run past him in Jesus' name. Ah, but if you don't get up, and if you don't really get ready on your set, Mark, go. If you don't do that, you, you'll just be staying behind. you are saying, you know, pastor is special. You are special too. The grace of God in me is the grace of God in you. And the same Jesus I've seen is the same Jesus you have seen. And tonight, everything inside you, glory will come in Jesus' name. The power of the Lord will come in Jesus' name. If you are already putting down your load and saying, I want to relax, repack that load, get ready now, because we're going higher. I said we're going farther. And we're going to do greater things for the Lord in Jesus' name. I see the glory of God coming over there. I said I see the glory of God coming over there. All tiredness, all weariness, everything will vanish away in Jesus' name. 
they are foreseen. We have this ministry as we have received mercy. We faint not, but we have renounced, we have renounced, we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, not handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation and the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of the Lord. Look at verse 16 here. It says, For which cause we faint not? I faint not. I said, I faint not. I said, I faint not. Nothing will discourage me. I say it for yourself. You will have what you say. You'll become what you say. And you'll climb up the ladder of what you say. Nothing will make you faint. No, don't just say amen. Say it for yourself. Nothing will discourage you. Nothing will crush you. Nothing will drive you back. You will move up. I say I will move up. You will move up. You will do more of the work of God. This work will prosper in your hand. This work will prosper in my hand. All your past mistakes, God will forgive. All your past problems, God will take away. All the disgrace of the past, they are gone. You will not come to shame. I will not come to shame. Glory. Glory. Glory upon your life. It is done in Jesus' name. For which cause we think not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Renewal has come. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, walketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. A weight of glory, a load of glory, an avalanche of glory, an abundance of glory will go with you from tonight in Jesus' name. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The glory of God is coming upon your soul. The glory of God is coming upon your life. And that glory, that glory, that glory, and the virtue of the Lord will multiply your life, even from tonight in Jesus' name. It says in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3, according as His divine power, He has given unto us all things. How many things have you got? That pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him which has called us to glory and to virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through loss partakers of the divine nature the nature of Christ will be passed into you even here tonight in Jesus name where are you there? Where are you there? Rise up and receive it. Rise up and receive it. The Lord wants us to see him. See him. See him. See him more. See him more. As you see him, all sins will vanish away. As you see him, even sicknesses will vanish away. As you see him, all your suffering will vanish away. As you see him, all those heartaches and all the discouragement, everything will vanish away. As you see him, even the coldness, lukewarmness will vanish away. As you see him, all the problems will melt away. As you see him, all the blindness will vanish away. As you see him, the scales on your eyes, everything will vanish away. As you see him, the guilt and the condemnation will vanish away. As you see him, a new life, a new life, a new lease of life will come unto you. As you see him, and you see him tonight, all those problems you are worried about in your family, in your place of work, in your ministry, in the church, in location there, everything will vanish away. As you see him tonight, tiredness will vanish away. As you see him tonight, all the pressure, all the oppression, everything will vanish away. See him tonight. See him tonight. We will see Jesus. We will see Jesus is your Savior. 
is your sanctifier. We will see Jesus is the supernatural one. We will see Jesus. Why don't you see him tonight? And all your fears will melt away. We will see Jesus. All those messengers of death, they'll be driven away from your life. We will see Jesus. And knowledge will come. Revelation will come. Enlightenment will come. We will see Jesus' power from on high will come upon your life. We will see Jesus tonight. And as you see Jesus, as you see Jesus, all the mountains will melt away. All the mountains will move away. As you see Jesus, your Red Sea will pass and you will cross over. As you see Jesus, He'll provide, you'll not be poor anymore. You will not be poor anymore. He'll provide manna from above. As you see Jesus, all the needs of your lives are going to be met. Even today, sir, we will see Jesus. My brother, there, don't go away. We will see Jesus. Sister, there, don't go away. We will see Jesus. Discouragement will melt away. Disease will go away. All those demonic powers will flee away. And all those problems will come to an end. And all the activities of the devil, all the activities of the enemy, everything will vanish away. I want to see him. 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 Why don't you see him tonight? Why don't you see him tonight? It will sanctify you. Why don't you see him tonight? He'll put you. Why don't you see him tonight? He'll purify you. Why don't you see him tonight? Glory, glory, glory will come to your life. Why don't you see him tonight? And you'll find that everything you have been desiring, I want this, I want this, everything will happen tonight. I want to see Jesus. I want to see Jesus. Behold him. Behold him. Look at him. Take his promise. Receive his nature. Reveals the power. I will see him. I will see him. And all the lukewarmness will vanish away. You will not be tired again. You will not be weary again. You will not faint anymore. I want to see him. See him tonight. See him tonight. See him tonight. See him tonight. Him tonight. And power will come. Guilt will vanish away. Your grief will vanish away. Grace will be poured into your life. Grace will be poured into your life. And goodness will come into your life. Godliness will come to your life. Greater grace, greater grace, greater grace will come. I see him tonight. I see him tonight. I'm not tired anymore. I see him tonight. I'm not weak anymore. I see him tonight. I'm not weary anymore. I see him tonight. See him. See him. See him. His name is Jesus. See him. His Savior. See him. His healer. See him is Redeemer. See him is the one that breaks every yoke. See him is the power of God in man. See him and all your problems are over. See him tonight. See him tonight. See him tonight. See him tonight. Sicknesses will not remain when you see him. Affliction will not remain when you see him. Ignorance will not remain when you see him. See him. All the family problems will vanish away. It will drive your tears away. It will wipe your tears away. See him. All those things they told you in the dream will not hold any water. Will not come true. All the paths of darkness which you wore against your life, against your family, deliverance will come. Deliverance will come. Deliverance will come. See him. See him and you're healed. See him and you're delivered. See him and you're empowered. See him and he'll give all things into your life. Ask, it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. He saves. He sanctifies. He baptizes in the Holy Ghost. Just see him. That's all. See him. But we see Jesus. But we see Jesus. But we see Jesus. See him, see him, see him. Your problems are solved. In Jesus' name we pray. I have seen him. I have seen him. I have seen him. What are you resolved that our Father in the name of Jesus? We thank you for revealing Jesus to everyone here tonight. He has tasted death for every man. I pray, Lord, eternal death is cancelled on behalf of everyone in Jesus' name. 
premature death is cancelled in Jesus' name. Untimely death is cancelled in Jesus' name. Accidental death is cancelled in Jesus' name. Terminal disease. Everything taken away in Jesus' name. I pray that all the weakness that will make anyone to just pass on like that, I cancel that thing tonight in Jesus' name. Life for everyone. Abundant life for everyone. Spiritual life for everyone. Supernatural life for everyone. Protection upon you. You go out, you come in protection. You are in the house, you are in the church protection. You are in the office, you are in the market protection. And all the messengers of death, they are cancelled and they are driven back from your life in Jesus' name. Receive his nature. Receive his godliness. Receive his glory. Weakness to pass away from your life. Strength to come. Power to come. Authority to come. And the anointing that breaks every yoke of prayer in your life now in Jesus' name. Everywhere you go, you'll see Jesus. When you are praying, you will see Jesus. While you are witnessing, you will see Jesus. While there's any problem, you will see Jesus. At the crossroad, you will see Jesus. Any time of confusion, you will see Jesus. When you are weak, you will see Jesus. When you are ministering, you will see Jesus. When you are evangelizing, you will see Jesus. Every moment of your life, at every crossroad, in every problem, see Jesus, you will maintain the victory. You become more than a conqueror. And I pray that the mighty power of God saturates your life even from tonight. Discouragement is gone. Fainting is gone. Powerlessness is gone. You have seen Jesus. You will never be the same again. Lord, confirm it in every life. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray.